Joining me as my special guest on the program today is Ann Barnhart, formerly of Barnhart Capital Management. And Ann, you were a commodity broker for eight years, and then you formed your own independent brokerage for six years. And a couple weeks ago, you made the painful decision to shut your doors because you felt your client's money and positions were no longer safe. What led you to draw those conclusions? Well, obviously, it was the MF Global Collapse, and more specifically, the fallout after the MF Global Collapse and the reaction by the CFTC, the SEC, and most especially by the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. The actions specifically by the Merck after the MF Global Collapse were unprecedented, unfathomable, and completely and totally intolerable. The Merck itself basically did the equivalent of sticking a 9 millimeter in their mouth and pulling the trigger. By not stepping forward, backstopping the MF Global client accounts, and at the very least, the Merck should have allowed the MF Global customers to liquidate their accounts and then transfer to other firms. What the Merck did was the worst possible thing. They froze those people out of their accounts, didn't even allow them to liquidate while the markets continued to trade. And I cannot overemphasize the importance of that, the risk that those people were exposed to in the cattle business. And my forte is cattle. I'm, I'm actually a, a cash cattle person. And my brokerage business was geared almost exclusively towards livestock and grain. I had a lot of contacts in the cattle industry who didn't necessarily do their futures business with me, but were contacts of mine who did do business through brokers that cleared through MF, who lost tens of thousands of dollars on hedge positions that they wanted to get out of but could not get out of in the week and a half after the MF global collapse. This has never happened before. This was a complete breach of fiduciary duty by the Chicago Mercantile Exchange itself to the point that it literally has destroyed the entire paradigm. I got to the point where I could no longer tell my clients that their free cash customer funds not even exposed to the marketplace, just their cash sitting in their account, non-margined, was not safe. I, I couldn't tell them that their money was safe. And at that point, it was morally incumbent upon me to get my clients out of this completely dysfunctional, basically destroyed marketplace, get them off those railroad tracks, and get them away from the risk. Now, I didn't clear through MF, but with the European collapse and knowing what we know about how these financial entities are leveraged in European paper and the cascading nature of all this, I had to act before the proverbial poop hit the fan. Because if you sit around and you wait until after the poop hits the fan, it's too late. You wouldn't get anybody out. So to me, it it wasn't really a painful decision. It was a complete no-brainer. In the past, when firms went under, customer funds were intact and the exchanges would step in as you mentioned earlier, to backstop everything, to keep customers 100% liquid. And normally, a quick transfer from the bankrupt firm, the bankrupt firm would be immediately replaced. Why do you think they did not allow that to happen this time? Uh, You tell me. Like I said, I'll use the word again. It's suicidal. What they did was suicidal. So you're absolutely right. Up until last month on Friday, October 31st, The customer seg funds rule was utterly sacrosanct. Even when REFCO imploded and imploded quite dramatically in 2005, no customer funds were gone. It was on the the prop trading side of the company, but the customer funds were there, were accounted for, and it is the onus of the mercantile exchange to audit these FCMs. MF Global was under the auspices and under the supervision, the, the auditing supervision of the CME, and I believe that MF was audited not just annually but quarterly. Also, there is the question of how in the world could the Merck miss the margin being posted? The Merck is supposed to be doing, is supposed to be moving equity and doing margin wire transfers twice a day, every day. How could those customer funds be quote unquote missing? They aren't missing, they were stolen. They were stolen by John Corzine and his cadre of associates at MF Global. So, yes, again, to your listeners who may not fully appreciate the gravity of this, 
This has never, ever happened before. Nothing even close to this has ever happened before. And it is the function of the mercantile exchange itself. The reason why the exchanges exist is that they stand in the middle of every transaction, and they act as the de facto counterparty to every single transaction so that, for example, my clients never had to worry about the creditworthiness of the other individual, whoever it might be, who was on the other side of any trade that they did. Now, for every buyer, there's a seller, that's right, and it's a one-for-one, it's a zero-sum game. But to ensure the creditworthiness and the integrity of the markets, the function of the mercantile exchange itself is to stand in the middle of every transaction and be the guarantor. So a year ago, when Terry Duffy held a press conference and said, never in the history of the mercantile exchange has a customer ever, ever lost funds resulting from the collapse of a firm, he was telling the truth a year ago. Everything changed on Halloween of this year, though, and that's why I had to shut the doors of, of my brokerage, because I could not in good conscience continue forward knowing that the mercantile exchange was no longer going to fulfill their fiduciary duty. In the futures market to begin with, which is highly leveraged, if you open up a futures contract, you're usually leveraged 10 to 1. So they require exceptional firm base on which to function. And the major integrity of the whole system is the segregation of customer funds. That was breached by MF Global. And let's not sugarcoat this, Anne. Basically, management stole all of the non-margin cash, invested it in highly speculative securities. And what has astonished me has been the reaction of the exchange and regulators. Where's the investigation into John Corzine? Well, that's the point of this. We are now living in a lawless, Marxist, communist, usurped what used to be a representative republic but is no more. This is no longer a nation of laws. This is now transformed into a nation of men. It doesn't matter what crime you commit. In the case of John Corzine, this man has stolen in excess of a billion dollars. I think by the time it's all panned out, it's going to be closer to three billion dollars of customer funds that he stole. Why did he do that? Is he stupid? Well, of course he's not stupid. This is a former head of Goldman Sachs. This man doesn't have a low IQ per se. Why in the world would a man wake up in the morning one day and say, you know what? I think I'm going to steal all the customer seg funds in this FCM that I'm running, which is the biggest FCM in the country. Yeah, I, that sounds like a good plan. No. Why would a man like that even engage in a nefarious plot like this because he knew going into it that he could get away with it. And the reason he could get away with it is because he is in tight with the Obama regime. He is one of Obama's top, top fundraisers. This Earlier this year, John Corzine had a fundraiser dinner at his New York City apartment for Barack Obama where it was charged at $35,000 a plate. Okay, He bundled high six figures for Obama in one evening. He is a crony of the regime. This is Marxist communism. There is no rule of law. And these people, these poor MF customers, are just sitting out here helpless to do anything because there is no law enforcement because this is no longer a nation of laws. The rule of law no longer exists. There is no longer justice in this nation, and no nation, no culture, no society can survive if there isn't a foundation of justice. That is why we are teetering on the precipice of collapse, and I foresee civil war coming within the next several years. You know, we had Gerald Salente on this program, and he had an account with Lynn Waldock, and he's been trading futures in gold. He had a plan, and when he built up enough, he would take delivery on gold. They stopped him out of his trade, sequestered his margin or his cash, and forced him out of a trade and closed his account. So what you're talking about, because the exchange did not backstop and then froze customer accounts, they forced probably, and would you say millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars of losses on these customers? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. If we're talking several billion in customer seg funds, then the losses that were incurred could easily by the customers in that week, week and a half that they were frozen out could easily, easily get into the hundreds of millions. It might even breach into the low billions. 
no question about that. And yeah, and even with options, you know, I've talked to, to cattlemen who have had put options on as hedges to put a floor underneath the price of cattle. Okay, so imagine this. You buy a put option four months ago. You pay the premium. You post that money. Then this happens. You're frozen out of your account. Your account gets transferred to another firm without your consent. By the way, none of the customers were allowed any input into this. Their accounts were just sent to R.J. O'Brien and other firms like that without their consent. And then once the positions were transferred, even if it was a risk-limited position like a long put option, then the new clearing firm called them the next morning after the trade settled and said, okay, there was no equity in your account because all that money got stolen, so you're going to have to pay the premium for this put option again. So it's doubling the cost, essentially, for a lot of these people out here who are dealing just in what's supposed to be the very risk-limited paradigm of long options. The entire situation could not have been handled any worse, and in fact, I would take it a step further. It was handled so poorly, I can't imagine that these people are that stupid at the Merck and at, at the CFTC and so forth. I can't believe that the bankruptcy trustee is that stupid. This almost seems like it was so bad that it had to have been nefarious. You know, and you believe that MF Global is just the tip of the iceberg, that there's massive industry exposure to European sovereign debt. In fact, the day you and I are doing this interview, the Fed just engineered a major swap with central banks. It was a central bank love fest on Wednesday of group money printing. So that tells me that central banks acting in unison the way they did on Wednesday that they're afraid that there's something big out there that is about to happen and they're trying to maybe plug a hole in the dike. Well, if anybody out there understands fourth grade arithmetic, you know for a metaphysical certitude that, that Europe is done. Europe is mathematically impossible. It cannot be saved. I mean, you want to make a start. You even want to make a start at trying to bail out Europe. We're talking $25 trillion just to start. And it would then, if you were going to bail out the entirety of Europe, you would now be talking into the hundreds of trillions of dollars. Okay, people, there isn't that much wealth or money on the surface of the Earth. The total gross domestic product of the entire planet Earth, I think, is just under $70 trillion. And we're talking about in excess of $100 trillion to bail out Europe, this is now mathematically impossible. These people have so leveraged themselves and so leveraged these governments in these countries, giving their brain-dead citizenry free handouts and entitlements, that it is now mathematically impossible to save the paradigm. It's not a matter of if the global financial system is going to collapse. Oh, it's going to collapse. You better trust and understand that. It's just a matter of when. And these these piddling little maneuvers that these people are making that the Fed is doing, oh, we're going to give Europe some money. Okay, what I saw this morning, what the Fed is, is getting ready to do in terms of Europe is going to keep Europe going for another seven days. Well, fantastic. Thanks for that. And that's literally the brain dead mindset of these politicians. All they're doing is looking to kick the can down the road. At first, it was kick the can down another 10, 12 years. Then it's kick the can down the road for another year. And then it was, well, let's kick the can down the road for another few months. Now we're literally to the point where all we can do is kick the can down the road for a matter of a few days. It's not going to make it. I'll be very surprised if we make it to Christmas. You know, one would have thought, Anne, after the 30 to 40 to 1 leverage leading up to the financial crisis of 2008, pre-Lehman, that financial firms would have learned, and especially a guy like John Corzine that saw Goldman have exposure to AIG with $13 billion of credit default swaps, which we bailed them out 100 cents on the dollar, apparently... This lesson was not learned at MF Global because what was the leverage? I think it was a figure like 100 to 1. It was just astounding. The only lesson that these criminal degenerates learned from the 2008 situation was that they could do anything they want and that pimp daddy government would bail them out. You have to understand, people like John Corzine, these are evil, evil people. 
He went into MF Global looking to rape that company personally for his own good. And that's what the motivation of a lot of these people are. You have to get your heads around this. You have to get your heads around the fact that there are truly evil people in the world who do not give a crap about anyone or anything except themselves, their own personal wealth, and their own personal power. And they would sell their grandmother to the Nazis for a nickel without hesitation if they thought they could get away with it. It's the same with people like John Corzine. And then we've talked about the fact that John Corzine is tied into the Obama regime. And we now know that the government is absolutely stuffed to the gills almost exclusively with this same type of moral degenerate culture. These people that are in the government, that are in the government, not just the Congress and the executive branch, but also in the bureaucracy, they're in it for themselves. They're in it for the money. And two weeks ago when we had the 60 Minutes expose on the insider trading, those of us who have been in the business have known intuitively that that was going on for a very, very long time. We knew that there was front-running going on by politicians. A great example of this is someone like Harry Reid. Harry Reid, when he entered Congress, had a low six-figure net worth. He now has an eight-figure net worth, and he's never done anything except be a United States senator, the salary, I think, of which is something like 170000 a year. How does that happen? How does a man with a $170,000 a year salaried position go from having a six-figure net worth to an eight-figure net worth? That doesn't make any sense unless he's doing nefarious, illegal, insider trading type deals. It's obvious what's been going on. You have to start acknowledging these people for what they are, and that is moral degenerates who are basically sociopaths and psychopaths, meaning they don't feel any sympathy or empathy for other human beings. The only thing they care about is themselves. They will do anything. They will steal. They will lie. They will cheat. They will do, they'll lie to your face. They'll look in a camera with this tremendous earnestness and lie with forked tongues through their teeth in order to advance their wealth and power. And if we as a people don't get real about this, if we keep having these Pollyanna visions that these people are all on our side and they're really looking out for us and they're doing the best they can, we will be corkscrewed into the ground and this nation will be reduced to a smoldering rubble. You've got to wake up. You know, there's something even worse as, as you look into it. It's been hinted and that there could be possible clawbacks regarding MF Global. I wonder if you might explain that possibility and what a clawback means for, let's say uh, you had an account at MF Global and, I don't know, you didn't feel comfortable with the commodities market, the volatility, you pulled your money out, they can go at, there's a possibility they can go after you. Oh, absolutely. Clawback is, is a fairly common tactic in bankruptcies. And what it is, is it's looking at the bankrupt entity and looking at the money that went out of that entity in the time period immediately preceding the collapse. And I don't know what time frame they would look at it. MF. I don't know if it would be 30 days or 60 days or 90 days. I have no idea. But the trustee has in the last two weeks said that, yes, clawback is on the table. So what that means is, let's say, for example, you're a savvy individual and you're a good steward of your money and you've got and you're doing business with a firm that clears through MF Global. You're looking at MF Global's publicly available bond yields. And you see in the six weeks before the collapse that their bond yields spiked parabolically. They went from 6 percent to 18 percent. That is a sure, sure sign of massive trouble. And so being an intelligent, informed, aware person who is a good steward of their wealth, what do you do? You say, I'm getting out of this company. I'm getting my money out of MF Global because something bad is about to happen looking at these bond yields. You could also do the same thing looking at the stock price. You could do the same thing looking at downgrades by the ratings agencies. There's all kinds of ways that you could come to these conclusions. The other thing is if you're a hedger. If you're a bona fide hedger, if you have positions on and the market moves in favor of your hedge position on the futures side, you don't leave that equity sitting in your account. What your broker, like me, does is they wire that money home because you're using that money probably to either offset a cash transaction or to pay down a revolving line of credit. There's, you're not getting in, any interest on your money sitting in MF Global, so you might as well get that equity out of there, send it home, and pay down your line of credit so you're not paying interest on that money. 
Okay, so there would organically have been lots and lots of money flowing out of that company in the period immediately before the collapse, either due to natural hedge, organic in and out functions, or due to intelligent people looking at the bond yields and saying, "Uh uh-oh, we better get out of here. The bankruptcy trustee can legally claw that money back say, okay, I'm going to go and I'm going to dive into your pocket now, and I'm going to claw back your money, which you, in your responsibility and in your good stewardship, pulled out of a company that you knew to be in trouble. Oh, yeah. So these MF customers, they will essentially be raped three times. They will have their cash stolen out of their accounts. They were then locked out of their position so that they couldn't trade and were fully exposed to market risk, paralyzed, unable to do anything for an excess of a week. And then number three rape is having the bankruptcy trustee come back and literally seize money out of your own personal checking accounts and business accounts and so forth and clawing it back to feed this bankrupt entity. And you know what the cherry on top of the Sunday of all this is? And this is what blows my mind. The bankruptcy trustee right now, as this is being recorded on the 30th of November, the bankruptcy trustee is still allowing MF Global to trade proprietarily for itself, for the company proper. It's unbelievable. Wow. The rule of law is dead in this country. You know, adding to this, just uh, prior to that, was the restructuring of Greek debt, where the Derivatives Association announced that it was a voluntary restructuring, so therefore the bankers didn't have to pay out on credit default swaps. So what you have here, Anne, I believe is a system where the government is protecting the too big to fail at the expense of the customers, and with it, the rule of law is thrown out to protect Wall Street. What does that say about the integrity of the system? It's no wonder people are losing faith. There is no integrity in the system. And let's make it simple. It's not just about the government protecting the quote-unquote too-big-to-fail banks. It's about criminal oligarchs as individuals protecting each other. They don't give a crap about the customers of J.P. Morgan or you know, City or Goldman or anything. What they care about is each other, okay? The Obama regime is protecting John Corzine proper, the individual, because he is one of them. He is one of these criminal oligarchs. And for those of your listeners who may not remember, John Corzine is a former congressman. But immediately preceding MF Global, he was the governor of New Jersey, and he just corkscrewed Jersey into the ground, and it's Chris Christie who beat John Corzine to become the governor of New Jersey, because, okay, so yes, this Republican, Chris Christie, was elected in New Jersey, uber-liberal, blue state New Jersey, because Corzine financially destroyed that state, and again, This guy is, of course, mine, is former head of Goldman. He's not stupid. You have to stop thinking that these people are just misguided or that there's some sort of a difference of opinion on economic theory. These people are nefarious variously trying to destroy everything in this country. It's called the Cloward Piven strategy. Go in and destroy and collapse the entire economy, everything, and then rebuild a new basically Marxist, socialist, fascist state out of the burning rubble of this destruction. This is intentional. This is nefarious. This is not a function of incompetence. It's a function of malice aforethought and conscientious theft and destruction. What would you advise? I'm a long-term believer in the bull market and commodities, but how do you play commodities when the futures market is no longer secure And what does this do to the proper functioning of the markets? In other words, now that you've closed your firm because you don't believe in the integrity of the system, and we've just listed a a series of reasons why, not honoring contracts, appropriating funds, not allowing trades to go off, and not one investigation. In fact, this goes even further than that. We had Bill Black, who was involved in the SNL scandal, and the SNL scandal 2,000 individuals went to jail. There has not been one criminal charge brought by the Justice Department since the 2008 crisis. So given that this is where we are, what do you advise and what will you do personally? Well, get the hell out. 
get out of all paper. And it's not just the, the commodities markets. This is going to cascade through everything. It's going to get into the equities. It's going to get into 401ks and IRAs. It's going to get into pension plans and so on and so forth. Total systemic collapse. Get out. I don't know how I can be any more plain about this. I say this over and over and over again, and then I get scads of emails saying, well, I can't get out of my 401k. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Take the penalty and get the hell out of there. What would you rather do? Would you rather pay the 10% penalty, or would you rather have it all go up in smoke? Because that's what we're staring down the barrel of. Number two, we seem to have this backwards. In terms of what I do, cattle and grain specifically, the futures markets are the derivative. The futures markets are derived from the actual cash commodity markets. Now, I'm blessed because my area of expertise is actually in the physical cash markets, actual cattle on the hoof. So I have a consulting firm, and I'll I'll continue to teach cattlemen how to trade actual physical cattle. But, yeah, to all the people out there listening, you're going to have to get away from paper and get back into physical commodities, the real deal, anything that's on paper, anything that involves a promise or commitment is no longer valid because, as we've said, there isn't a rule of law anymore. People can steal from you. Your money can be confiscated. And think how easy now it is to confiscate people's wealth. Most of our wealth in this society exists as zeros and ones on a computer server. It takes no effort whatsoever to steal zeros and ones on a computer server. So what I've been telling people is you need to get into physical commodities. And the rule of thumb is is that if you can stand in front of it with an assault rifle and physically protect it, then it's real. It's a real commodity. That includes food. That includes water. That includes long guns and ammunition. That includes fuel. That includes precious metals, gold and silver coinage, most especially silver coinage, because silver is the metal of barter and transaction and currency. Gold is the, is the storage metal because it's so valuable per ounce. And also silver is extremely undervalued relative to gold because that market has been synthetically suppressed for the last several years by, again, these nefarious actors. So, yeah, reallocate into physical commodities. How do you know that somebody like, just as we saw in 2008 or recently with MF Global, that somebody like a Goldman, a J.P. Morgan, which was writing credit default swaps on European debt, how do you know if you have an account with this group that they pledge your assets for collateral or, or they commingle them with the firm's assets, and then what do you do? Oh, exactly. Corzine isn't alone in this. The reason the MF Global situation happened the way it did is, as we alluded to earlier, because Corzine had that company just suicidally leveraged. He took those customer funds and then leveraged it into European sovereign junk paper at about a 100 to 1 ratio. Okay, massive, massive leverage. That's why his collateral call was the first one to come and why it took him out, because he was so heavily leveraged. Don't kid yourself. These other entities are doing the same thing. It's just that they're not as heavily leveraged as Corzine was. So, yes, the entire paradigm is no longer trustworthy. There is no meaningful government or industry-wide regulation, and I've been saying this for years, that regulation in the financial industry in the United States, both government-based and private regulation, private industry regulation, is a monstrous, monstrous joke. The top tier of those organizations are evil, nefarious people, the mid-level are halfway stupid, halfway evil, who again would, are just there to collect their salary paycheck and will say and do anything that they're told and who really don't understand the business that they're trying to regulate. And then the lower level, the grunts, the actual auditors who go out on site, a lot of those people are super incompetent, affirmative action hires, and yes, I said it, and I'm not ashamed of it. They are affirmative action hires. They have no business being there doing what they're doing. They're also hiring a lot of kids 15 minutes out of college who literally are reading off a script and couldn't audit a company if their life depended on it. And so what they do is they send these incompetent people out into the field and into lower management, and then when the poop hits the fan, they blame them. It's 
absolutely evil and it's a complete joke. And Madoff was the first proof of that. There have been other Ponzi schemes since Madoff happened that haven't gotten as much notoriety, but there was a big one in the futures industry that all of the FCMs were were invested in. And the regulatory body of the futures industry, the NFA, they audited that Ponzi scheme. They totally missed it. They even admitted that they signed off on it because they really didn't understand what they were doing. I mean, that's the level of incompetence and evil that we're talking about in terms of these regulatory bodies. The only way to fix this is to shut the whole damn thing down and start from scratch. And I'm personally looking within the next decade for the emergence of a new exchange in the United States. Word on the street is is that it might happen in Dallas, and I'd be fully in favor of that. Start over from scratch. All right. Well, the message, get physical and protect yourself. We've been speaking with Ann Barnhart, formerly of Barnhart Capital Management. Ann, I want to thank you for coming on the program and sharing your thoughts. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. Joining me as my special guest of the new year is Ann Barnhart, formerly of Barnhart Capital. And Ann, there was a, um article in the Wall Street Journal at the end of the year, and it was titled, Are Brokerage Accounts Safe? And they went on to talk about that they were rather doubtful that MF Global customers would get all their money back. And I guess one of the questions that comes to mind, I know in our industry, in the brokerage industry, we have SIPC that is supposed to stand in place if something untoward happens inside a brokerage firm. Somebody absconds with the money that's it's covered up to half a million dollars. What is the role of the CME, and why isn't the CME backing these accounts at MF Global? Well, I'm so happy that you brought this up right off the bat. We all, all of us need to get real about this and just stop and think logically about this. SIPC, FDIC, and now we even have apparently Terry Duffy admitting the mercantile exchange and the exchange itself, which is supposed to backstop and, and essentially act as the de facto insurer of the futures industry. All of these systems of quote-unquote insurance are designed to cover just discrete failures of individual firms. They are in no way designed to, and it would be mathematically impossible for them to cover a systemic failure. I mean, we've got to just stop and think for two seconds, okay? If the entire system collapses, there isn't enough money. There isn't enough money in this country to cover and insure all of the deposits in banks. So that would reference the FDIC. In brokerage accounts, in stock brokerage accounts, which would reference SIPC, And, of course, now we all know in the futures industry, Terry Duffy admitted to James Katulis that the reason that the Merck didn't come in and backstop MF Global, and they could have done it easily, the Merck had an $8 billion default emergency slush fund sitting, and it's still there, sitting ready, waiting to go. That was the essential insurance fund that the Merck itself was carrying. The, Terry Duffy admitted to James Katulis's face in a face-to-face interview that they could have made MF Global's problems go away instantly. They could have stepped in. They could have taken over the company, essentially. They could have squared the books and then sold the company either in total or piecemealed it out. They've done this before, okay? The reason that Terry Duffy said that they didn't do it is because if they establish the precedent right now of backstopping MF Global, that they would then be establishing a precedent of backstopping everybody, and they would be expected to backstop everybody. And Terry Duffy and everyone else at the Merck and everyone else in this industry who has a brain in their head knows that all of the FCMs are doing this. Everybody is hypothecating and rehypothecating and sending money to London so it can be infinite leveraged. They know that it's a house of cards. Think about the enormousness of this. Terry Duffy and the Merck knew they had one of two decisions. They could either 
backstop MF Global, and then when the poop hit the fan after Europe collapses, which could be literally any day now. I'm shocked that we've made it this far. I was saying I would be shocked if Europe made it to Christmas. We made it to Christmas. So, I mean, we're on borrowed time now. It could literally go at any point. And Terry Duffy and the Merck know that four minutes after Europe collapses, that all of these firms in the United States are going to go the same way. So they had a choice, either guarantee the complete and total destruction of the for-profit corporation that is now the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, or breach their fiduciary duty, admit to everybody's face that they are no longer going to fulfill their fiduciary duty, and after the collapse happens, at least try to get away with the personal shareholders in the CME corporation with some sort of a salvage value, some sort of a remnant. Those were their choices. And so they chose to breach their fiduciary duty. If we're sitting around here talking about SIPC insurance and FDIC insurance, I mean, you've got to be out of your mind. The entire thing is going to collapse. There isn't that much money anywhere. These insurance policies and these insurance organizations and the role of the Merck itself, all they were designed to do was to cover discrete individual firm failures. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about the whole thing going up in smoke. We've got to wake up, people. You've got to think. You've got to think logically and reasonably and mathematically. We're talking about numbers that are so huge that they're simply impossible. What does that tell us, and then, about people that have their money in bank accounts? We just found out from a Bloomberg lawsuit. They sued the Fed to find out what the Fed was doing during 2008. And we found out, I mean, people were upset about the $700 billion of TARP money, but that was chicken fee. If we look at what the Fed did, they either backstopped, loaned, swapped, and guaranteed $8 trillion. Bank of America got $100 billion. Morgan Stanley got $60 billion. What does that say about our banking system, people that have money on deposit at banks? Oh, it's over. It's over. It's just a matter of when does the poop actually hit the rapidly spinning rotors. But it's over. All of the big banks, Bank of America, J.P. Morgan, Citi, Wells Fargo, yada, 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 not only are these banks all completely and totally insolvent, they're insolvent multiple times over. I've been saying for months, Get your money out of all of the big banks. Your best bet at this point is to get into a small, locally owned, probably rural type of a bank because those people have common sense and haven't engaged in this evil, ridiculous, greed-driven leverage upon leverage upon leverage. There are banks out in rural America that are on fabulous footing, but you're still going to have a risk even if you move into those banks, because when the entire system collapses, you just have the overall risk of, you know, not having your system intact anymore. And number two, you would also have to assume that if the system does collapse, that the regime in Washington is then going to make the attempt to seize all of the solvent banks and attempt to redistribute all of that wealth to their cronies. So it's not a perfect solution, but for the time being, you get your money out of the big banks, and then I would advocate just having enough cash in a bank account to pay your bills, essentially, and just kind of go hand to mouth in that sense. But yeah, it's like I said, it's over, and we're just living on borrowed time right now. And the thing that's just maddening and also so sad is that we've had so much warning and so much time to prepare, but yet 99% of the people in this country either don't have any idea what's going on, if they do see it, they're too lazy or stupid to understand, and a large proportion of the people who actually do understand what's going on are too cowardly to even make a decision and be aggressive and make any proactive moves to protect themselves, to protect their wealth, and to protect their family. Those are the people that infuriate me the most. I want to move on back to MF Global and the role of J.P. Morgan. It was brought out in some of the work that James Katulis has done that J.P. Morgan, unbeknownst to the trustees or even clearing through the trustees, went and bought assets of MF Global, which should have been used to make the customers whole. They bought it at a steep discount with no open bidding 
turned around, flipped it for a 13% profit to George Soros and people like that. They did not disclose their ownership in the London Metals Exchange. And furthermore, they tried to get a letter from the Fed claiming the segregated fund should not be held in terms of protecting the clients. I was just absolutely blown away that there is no regulatory authority or somebody looking out for the customer here, but rather instead protecting the big banks. Well, we've covered this before. This is no longer a nation of laws. It's a nation of men. We are living in a Marxist, fascist oligarchy. And J.P. Morgan is running this table. They are running this bankruptcy. This bankruptcy from day one, and this was clearly premeditated by all parties concerned with malice aforethought, the MF Global bankruptcy was fraudulently, nefariously, illegally filed as a subchapter 3, chapter 7 bankruptcy, which covers a securities firm. MF Global was not a securities firm. It was a commodity brokerage. My God, if MF Global isn't a commodity brokerage, then there's no such thing as a commodity brokerage. This bankruptcy should have been filed under subchapter 4 of the Chapter 7 Bankruptcy Code, which specifically covers commodity brokerage firms. And most importantly, whenever you have a subchapter 4, Chapter 7 bankruptcy filing, the customers, the customers, the customers go to the front of the line. They are at the front of the line on the bankruptcy estate, needless to say. This was clearly premeditated and driven by J.P. Morgan to be fraudulently filed under Subchapter 3. MF Global only had less than 400 securities accounts. They had between 35 and 40,000 futures accounts. But they filed it as a Subchapter 3 securities firm bankruptcy, and guess who goes to the front of the line? The creditors. Who's creditor number one to MF Global? Guess who? J.P. Morgan. They are running this table. J.P. Morgan and Jamie Dimon are personally running this table. They are screwing the customers, and they have essentially destroyed the entire financial system paradigm in this country. This is why I'm calling for a general financial market strike. How much longer are you going to put up with this? Are you just going to sit and watch, and you're so cowardly that you can't even pull your money out of the market? Hey, that's a completely nonviolent remedy. What happens when this descends into hot war? What are you cowards going to do? If you can't even close a brokerage account, how are you going to stand on front lines when people are firing at you? It's absolutely shameless that nobody will react to this. They just sit and watch. Going back to this segregation of account, because this leads to what looks like criminal activity. In the Wall Street Journal article, they made a reference to this $1.2 billion shortfall. And they said it shouldn't have been possible. Brokerage firms were required to segregate customer accounts from the firm's account. And basically what they said here is in that process, the customer's accounts could easily be transferred to a new broker taking over, like, for example, when Revco went under. Does this go back right here to what you were talking about earlier, is they did want to do this because this is so widespread that had they done this, but I guess, Ann, how was it possible for them to take segregated accounts and move them the way they did? This sounds criminal to me. Criminal. The government is criminal. The oligarchy, the people running these firms and running these big banks, they're all psychopaths and criminals. You can write as many laws as you want to, but so long as you have a criminal, illegitimate government that's in bed with what's essentially a mafia on steroids, as long as that's what's running your country, you can write as many laws as you want. They are never going to be enforced. Eric Holder has not said word one about MF Global. Not a single word. Nothing is going to happen to Corzine so long as this criminal, evil government and this oligarchy of these people running these firms or who's running this country. You can obviously show that all of this is criminal. These people stole in excess of a billion dollars. They were breaking laws left, right, sideways, any which way you want to look at it. 
nobody's going to do anything because these are the people that are running the show, that are running the government, and that are running the financial system. Pass all the laws that you want, as long as there's no integrity, and as long as these people will never be held to any account whatsoever, nothing is ever going to get better or change, which is, again, not to sound like a broken record, the only remedy to this is to declare a general financial market strike and everybody just pull out. Take their power away from them. If you just keep doing business with these people, you are, in essence, supporting this criminal fascist regime. Well, that's one of the things James Catullus has recommended is pulling out accounts at J.P. Morgan. I want to go back to John Corzine for a moment, because in his testimony, which I found somewhat disconcerting because half the people on the committee hearing the testimony he was a fundraiser for, but he said he didn't knowingly or intentionally do anything wrong regarding the account segregation, which is critical because it does allow transfers to another firm it would appear as of some form of criminal activity. And what I find amazing is after filing bankruptcy, he's giving fundraisers for the president. There is no investigation. The Justice Department is doing nothing. And, and this brings me back to 2008 crisis. Unlike the SNL crisis, where over 2,000 white-collar criminals went to jail or prison, According to Bill Black, there has been no criminal indictment since 2008, as we have seen here with a very blatant case, the eighth largest bankruptcy in U.S. history, and there are no indictments. Well, again, (laughs) what do you expect? Do you expect John Corzine to go sit before Congress and to tell the truth? These people are psychopaths. When they stand up and they raise their hand and they swear an oath to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth... That means absolutely nothing to them. Nothing. Why in the world would you think that John Corzine or any of this other degenerate human detritus that is polluting our land, why do you think they would tell the truth? These people have no conscience. They have no integrity. Lying is part of their daily modus operandi. Why would you believe anything this man says? Of course he's going to go before Congress and say, I can't recall, I have no knowledge, I didn't intentionally do dot, dot, dot. He's a filthy, flipping liar. Why in the world would you believe him? I mean, at what point are we going to wake up and start calling these people for what they are? Well, Corzine said he didn't know. Well, no kidding. What do you think? He's going to go sit there and say, yeah, I stole all this and say, come and get me, baby. Of course he's not going to do that. That's what he says behind closed doors. He knows he's free as a bird. Initially, I was surprised that Corzine even testified before Congress. But then I realized, why not testify? before Congress. He knows that nobody is ever going to come after him in any sort of a legal sense. He knows he's in good with the Obama regime. He knows Eric Holder is never going to touch him. Why not go sit before Congress and lie to their faces? There's never going to be any consequence for it. This is why I brought up the issue of execution. Execution should be on the table for these people because they don't understand anything else. You can't shame them. You can't publicly humiliate them because they have no integrity to be shamed. Essentially, these people, their hearts are so blackened, they almost are animals walking around without a soul. You can't shame that. You can't make them feel sorry for what they've done. And if you don't have any justice in your nation, and this obviously falls under the category of capital punishment, because it is economic treason. Any act of treason against a nation is a capital offense. This is treason. This is economic treason. It is attempting to overthrow the financial system and the entire economic structure of the United States of America. Of course it's a capital offense. And if we don't start having justice, if we don't start applying justice to these people, what signal is this sending? What signal is it sending to the next group of trash at Goldman Sachs right now? It's telling them, boys, you put the pedal all the way to the floor because you can do absolutely anything. And as long as you raise enough money for whatever piece of garbage is sitting in the White House, you're free as a bird. You will never touch you. 
I mean, if, if Corzine gets away with this, think what's going to be happening 10 years from now, if we even make it that far. To add to this issue further, there was two issues in the recent January issue of Bloomberg Markets. One was what the Fed knew. This is based on a lawsuit that Bloomberg brought against the Federal Reserve, trying to find out just exactly what they were doing behind the scenes during the credit crisis. And, and it revealed that the Fed either backstopped, guaranteed, or swapped nearly $8 trillion. That was bad enough in itself. But I think the worst article was a follow-up article, and it was called, When Hank Paulson Tipped His Hand. And apparently what happened is in a meeting at Eaton Park in September, Paulson calls in 12 hedge fund managers, everyone from James Chanos, people from Stephen Mandel, They were all 12 hedge fund managers, and the Treasury Secretary revealed half the hedge fund managers were ex-Goldman alumni. But what he did is he revealed the government's plans to possibly take over Fannie and Freddie in a conservatorship. Now, so here you have a gentleman, and this is just a quote from the article going back to William Black, an associate professor at economics at the University of Missouri, he said, why would a Treasury secretary like Paulson feel compelled to share the Treasury Department's plan with fund managers? You just never do that as a government regulator. Transmit non-public market information to market participants. There was no legitimate reason for this because basically you were revealing inside information to fund managers who could profit from it. And they show a graph that after that meeting, the short position in Fannie and Freddie went up considerably. So here was an article, uh, two articles that showed not only what the Fed was doing behind the scenes, basically loaning $100 billion to banks like Bank of America. At the same time, the president of Bank of America was touting to the public how sound and strong his bank was, which is one of the reasons why they were taking over other banks. But this is even more pervasive than I thought. I mean, here's a secretary of the Treasury revealing to hedge fund managers inside information that they could profit from. Wow. So you mean this fascistic oligarchy that we're living under is populated by people who don't view their roles, like, for example, as Secretary of the Treasury, as being a servant to the people of the United States, and rather they're using their position as the Secretary of the Treasury to kick back money to Goldman Sachs? I'm shocked. Knock me over with a feather. Come on, guys. Wake up. <laughs> that, that's all I can say. Wake up. You mentioned that, uh, as James Catullus has talked about, How does a market function like this, Anne? Because I'm thinking of the type of clients that you had that are farmers. If I'm a farmer out there, I need a futures market that I can hedge my crops or my harvest to protect myself. If I'm Southwest Airlines and uh, I know that fuel costs are going up and fuel is a major component of my cost structure, I need to go out and hedge with fuel costs. How can an economy function without a futures market? Because there is a very legitimate purpose of futures used to hedge uncertainty for the agricultural industry, for industries such as the airlines. How do we function without one? Well, what's going to happen, and what I sincerely hope happens, is that everybody pulls out of the corrupt system as it exists now, and then what will happen is a vacuum, a massive, massive vacuum will be created, and the market will always find a way. Someone will set up a new system somewhere. I don't know if it could be done inside of the United States. I doubt it because any market that you try to start up inside of the United States would be immediately scuttled and shut down by the fascistic regime in Washington, coupled with the massively corrupt regulatory oversight bodies, both government-based and private. They would never allow someone to start something up new. So you're probably going to have to go offshore somehow. The other thing that I think is within the realm of possibility and what I'm hearing is that there is going to be a mass exodus of risk management products into, and get ready for this, into the Chinese market. And the reason is, is because the Chinese government 
knows and understands that market integrity is utterly essential. And the Chinese government will kill you if you engage in the kind of stuff that John Corzine has done. So people will look and they will say, what is the market that has the most integrity with the best regulatory oversight standing behind it, and who will enforce the rule of law? And I cannot even believe that these words are coming out of my mouth. But right now, it looks like the best place to be would probably be in China. And who's to say? I mean, the Chinese, the Russians, all of these people have been using the U.S. futures markets to hedge grain and petroleum and so on and so forth. Who's to say that if the Chinese don't set something up and it is a sensible, reasoned, and well-regulated market, who's to say that 10 years from now, everybody isn't trading corn and beans and wheat and crude oil and all of these other products on a Chinese futures market exchange? It could totally happen. People will go to wherever there is a market with integrity. And the fact right now that Red China (laughs) has what appears to be the most trustworthy and well-regulated financial markets on the planet is a testament to the fact of how far the human race has fallen when communists, communists have the best regulated financial markets. What an absolute scathing, scathing indictment of how far this nation has fallen. And in this regard, what happens if the government puts in capital controls? Because when capital flees, there's also a currency risk that the currency begins to falter. What if the government was to put in capital controls? Then what? There's all these things. What if the government does this? What if the government does that? There are many, many lines in the sand where if the government attempts to cross them, and it wouldn't surprise me if they cross enough lines, if you start seeing states secede and so on and so forth. If you see a Texas secede or, or a Wyoming or something like that. If they're that stupid and they want to push it that far, they can. We're ready to go. And it seems like we're heading up to a tipping point, as you made reference to earlier, because we've seen throughout the last decade, for example, our credit rating agencies in cahoots, with Wall Street giving out AAA ratings on what was called junk mortgages. Nothing happened there. We saw the crisis in accounting with the Enron WorldCom scandals at the beginning of the decade, followed by the mortgage crisis, and then followed by such scandals as, let's say, Bernie Madoff, where the SEC was apprised of the issue by Harry Marco Polo several times, and they look the other way. We know that we have naked short selling going on in the markets, and the SEC does nothing about that. So at some point, you would think that either this comes to a head and markets go elsewhere, as you were pointing out, maybe we start trading on China. Do you think there's a possibility that the markets here could be rehabilitated? In other words, people rise up, whether it's the Occupy movement, it's the Tea Party movement, enforce the hand of government, enforce these criminals out of office? Well, (laughs) the Occupy movement, no, I don't think so. Those people are all drug users who want to see marijuana legalized. That's the driving force behind the Occupy movement. When it gets to the point, and I think what will probably be the catalyst that really gets it going is when what happens to the MF Global customers starts happening to people's retirement accounts, starts happening to 401ks and IRAs and so on and so forth. When the average American out there who's sitting there on their sofa flipping ballroom dancing and football all day every day, the bread and circuses crowd just having everything spoon-fed to them, when they look around and they realize that this government is stealing their retirement, Oh, I think that's when it will come to pass. But at this point, this isn't an issue that can be solved by, well, just wait till the 2012 elections and boy, we're going to get some more people in there. I'm convinced at this point that anybody who would run for a national office has got to be some sort of a psychopath. I mean, anybody who would want to walk into that godforsaken degenerate mess in Washington, D.C. and actually wade through that hip deep sewage that is the human detritus that populates Washington, D.C., you'd have to be out of your mind. And, I mean, anyone of any goodwill at all, if you attempted to run for office, this media, who is 
basically an operational arm of this fascistic oligarchy that has taken over Washington, D.C., any decent human being would be absolutely destroyed, character-wise, character assassination, by this media. I mean, and they'll go after anybody for anything. Meanwhile, their guys can literally be, you know, raping children or killing babies or, or doing anything else, and these people can essentially do no wrong, and they will never report on anything. So this is not something that is going to work itself out organically. This is not something that can be worked out through elections at this point. We are going to have to have what basically boils down to a revolution. And when you issued your letter last year, James Catullus responded to your letter, and he said, rather than bowing out, keep up the fight. How would you respond to that? Uh, That's absolutely insane. The only way to fight at this point is to pull out of the system altogether. Look, if I stay in business and I know, I know what's going on and I know that the risk that my clients are facing, if I stay in business and just sit here navel-gazing, waiting for the other shoe to fall, like some completely impotent, miserable coward... (laughs) That's not proving any point to anybody. That's me being a coward and not doing the right thing by my clients. We now know that the Chicago Mercantile Exchange has admitted verbally to Mr. Catullus himself that they will no longer perform their fiduciary duty. They will no longer backstop. Okay, if a client calls me and says, Ann, look, I'm worried. Is my money safe? If I tell them no, if I tell them the truth and I tell them no, then I've just answered the question. No, your money isn't safe. We need to get you out of here, and we need to get all of your positions liquidated and send your money home and get you as far away from this mess as possible, and hopefully do it in such a way that you aren't even liable to claw back actions. If I say, yes, your money is safe, I'm a liar. I'm a liar, and I am breaching my fiduciary duty to my customer. It is now a catch-22. The only honorable solution and the only honorable thing that any financial professional can do is to shut it down, get the clients out of there, and send the money home. Why won't these people do this? Because they are so attached to their wealth and their business, and they are so cowardly that they're not willing to lay down their good thing, which is their business. And I'm sure Mr. Catullus makes a tremendous amount of money. I made a little bit of money. I didn't do bad. It was good for a one-man IB. But you have to be willing to detach yourself from your wealth and say, look, this isn't worth it. I have to let go of this. I have to let this go so that I can protect my customers and hopefully so that some point in the future we can fix this system and reform it. Okay? If I'm writing all this stuff and posting it on my website, or in Mr. Catullus's case, if he's representing these people and he's in the belly of the beast and he sees what's going on, and you have objective evidence and you know for a fact what's going on, and you don't act and act decisively and swiftly to protect your clients, now that moral failing is on you and it's on you personally. I will not do that. I will not set by and watch my clients be destroyed because I'm too much of a selfish, greedy, wealth-obsessed person that I won't lay down my business and say, okay, it's over. We can't do this anymore. And that goes back to Christian faith. And I know that a lot of people don't want to hear about this, but you know what? Y'all are going to learn a big lesson here. The reason why all this is happening at the end of the day is because this is a godless nation. And we do not fear God. We sin without any compunction whatsoever. And these people running around have no morality and no integrity. There is no fear of any external consequences for any of our decisions. And so we just all go through life saying, it's all about me. It's all about me. I'm going to get mine. And no matter who I have to rape, no matter who I have to steal from, no matter who I have to kill, baby, I'm going to get mine. And that's why we're going down the tubes. And what do you tell your clients, though? Like, you dealt with farmers, you dealt with ranchers. How do they protect themselves if they can't use the futures market to hedge this year's corn crop or this year's beef? What do they do? 
Well, in terms of the cattle markets, the cattle markets are fabulously liquid. They are the most liquid cash commodity markets on the face of the earth. So it is completely and totally possible to be self-hedged in the cash markets in terms of cattle. In terms of grain, it's a little bit more difficult because grain farmers are completely and totally locked into a seasonal paradigm. The, the crop is planted at X date, it is harvested at Y date, and you are locked into that. What the grain farmers are now realizing is... If they harvest their crop and they take it to the elevator and deliver it and hold it in storage there and don't sell it, and they're paying the storage to the elevator to have their grain, if the elevator gets caught up in some mess in Chicago, which all of the grain elevators are using the futures markets, all of them are, I can't imagine that there's a single elevator in North America that isn't using futures. If an elevator gets caught up in this and fails as a result of this, The farmers who have their grain in storage at the grain elevator, even though the grain elevator doesn't own it, they're just holding it as storage, that grain becomes part of the estate of the grain elevator. And so the farmer, again, is just going to be absolutely, totally raped in all this. So what the realization that we're all coming to now is, and again, let's just go back to the Stone Age, on-farm storage, on-farm storage, on-farm storage, on-farm storage. You have to have it on your property. You can't even store it at an elevator, not even involved in the futures markets, just storing in an elevator who in turn is using the futures markets because when these markets collapse, it cascades back through the system. You can't even have it off your property. So get ready to see a lot of farmers within the next few months installing on-farm storage and holding their crop, and then probably they're going to start engaging in more direct sales directly to the end users. So direct sales directly to feedlots, not going through an elevator, or direct sales to you know a food company or something like that. Again, bypassing the elevator, and this is tragic. The grain elevators, those are wonderful people, and they provide a fabulous service. But again, if we have no rule of law, and Corzine and his ilk are allowed to get away with this stuff, it has a cascading systemic effect. This is why it's economic treason. This isn't just a matter of stealing a few bucks out of some, quote, 1% type people who are trading futures in Chicago. This cascades all the way back all the way through the food production sector of this country. It is an act of treason. Well, listen, Anne, as we close, I want to thank you for once again joining us here on the Financial Sense News Hour. Why don't you give out your blog site if our listeners would like to follow your comments and the things that you're looking into? Sure. It's my old commodity brokerage's website, and I'm not a commodity broker anymore, but it's www.barnhart, spelled B A R N H A R. D T dot biz B I Z and it's just essays with my commentary and interesting links to other good programs and essays. All right, we've been speaking with Ann Barnhart once again. Ann, thanks for coming on the program. I want to wish you a happy and prosperous new year and keep up the fight. Thank you, sir. Happy New Year to you and all of your listeners.